Okay, thank you very much, Marcus, and also thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be like virtually here today and to talk to philosophers, but also many linguists. I saw, a, and I don't know if there are also other people from other disciplines, but this was a great occasion for me to really think through my own intuitions about uh, grammaticality. So, uh, I mean, I hope you will like to talk, let's see. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank my two, let's see if, okay, my two collaborators, John Sprouse from the Department of Linguistics and with Table, who is also here from Psychological Sciences. Um, so nothing of this would have been uh, possible without them. So we, we did the experiments together, we conceived them, I will present a bunch of them today. Uh, and also the modeling part, which I will not really present it in details today, but I will refer to, uh, was also done in collaboration with them and especially with WIT. So I'm really grateful uh, to them for this amazing work we did together. Okay, so let's start. Uh, let's consider this sentence. The boy loved the book. So this sentence contains uh, an error. Um, a grammatical violation because the subject, the boy, does not agree in number with uh, its verb. Uh, but nonetheless, it should be very easy for us to figure out the meaning of this sentence. And we will suddenly realize that the sentence actually means that the boy loves the book. Um, in this other case, what did you that think the boy read? This is probably slightly more difficult than the previous one. But again, I think you will probably figure out the, that this sentence actually uh, means something like, what did you think that the boy reads? So we just inverted two words, think and that. But now what about this sentence? What did you wonder whether the boy read? Mm, this should be slightly more difficult. So maybe you're wondering what this sentence could, could mean. And what about this other one? What did you smile because the boy reads? This is also pretty difficult to understand. And then if, you, if we go through this last one, what cry if why is Andy angry the? Well, this is uh, completely nonsensical. This is maybe not even a sentence. This is just a word salad and we cannot extract the meaning of it. So with these examples, these initial examples, um, we can see that all these sentences above were ungrammatical. Uh, but there is no doubt that we can understand at least some of them. Um, but not all grammatical violations are perceived in the same way. Some of them are clearly more severe than others. And this observ observation actually suggests that there is a sense in which we can parse ungrammatical sentences. So we can compute them and extract their meaning. But the question, the main question uh, underlying this talk is how does this happen? How can we process ungrammatical sentences, which are the mechanisms underlying ungrammatical sentence processing? So first of all, let me start uh, with a bunch of traditional assumptions that are widely shared uh, in the field. So first of all, the grammar of a given language like English is traditionally conceived as a system of rules that generates all and only the well-formed structures of that language. Second, to explain processing phenomena, so how we understand and or produce in real time the sentences of a given language, then we have to add a theory of parsing to the theory of grammar. Third, the meaning of a sentence uh, is computed on the output of the grammar. So under this view, there are two distinct, distinct modules, one for the syntax and another one for semantics. And we usually think that uh, there is a fit forward relation between the two, such that the output of syntax is the input of semantics. And finally, uh, this traditional, traditional grammar plus parsing theory can generate output incrementally in real time. So basically word by word as the sentence is processed. So we are not waiting until the end of the sentence to compute uh, the syntax or the semantics of the sentence, but we do this incrementally. Uh, okay, so these traditional assumptions have 
a bunch of implications. And especially I will focus on the implication of the very first assumption, that is the idea that the grammar is a system of rules that generates only the well-formed structures of uh, a given language. So the first implication of this conception is that ungrammatical sentences are simply not generated by the grammar. So the derivation of the sentence stops as soon as the linguistic input cannot be accommodated by any rule of the grammar. And second, the output of the grammar is strictly binary. So we can either follow a rule or violate a rule, nothing in between. So we can either have grammatical sentences or ungrammatical sentences, but nothing in between in terms of grammaticality. And these two implications have two corresponding challenges. So the first one is that if the derivation of the sentence stops, crashes, as soon as ungrammaticality is detected, and if semantics is computed over syntactic representations, then we shouldn't be able to derive the meaning of ungrammatical sentences at all, not even seemingly very easy ones like John loved the book. The second challenge uh, are gradient effects. So if the grammar produces strictly categorical outcomes, grammatical versus ungrammatical, then there is no room for intermediacy. And so all the patterns, the gradient patterns that we started to see at the beginning of this talk, like certain violations seems to be more severe than others, cannot be accommodated under this view. But now, now let me tell you what is the traditional answer, because of course syntacticians and linguists thought about this a lot, and they have an answer to this. So the idea is that whichever system or mechanism is responsible for ungrammatical sentence processing and its gradient patterns, this must be outside of the grammar module. And we can think of a bunch of systems that can be responsible for that. For, for instance, repair strategies, reanalysis mechanism, memory limitations, interference, semantics, etc. But the idea is always that um, regardless the particular mechanism that we are going to postulate, the idea is that it, it is outside of the grammar and it usually kicks in uh, after that the grammar uh, couldn't derive the sentence because there was a violation of the grammar. So now let me tell you how I will organize the talk today. So first of all, I will try to substantiate the claim that ungrammatical sentences cannot be generated under the traditional view of the grammar. So I will try to be very precise in this in order to substantiate this, uh, this claim. Then I will turn to gradient effects and I will show you that gradients is a core phenomenon in language. So we see it all over the places. It's not at all a marginal phenomenon. It's pervasive and is also measurable. So we can run experiments to measure very precisely how gradient these effects are. Um, so given, given that it's not marginal, uh, we really want to have a theory of that if we want to have like a comprehensive theory of language. And in order to show you gradient effects, I will focus as a test case on a particular um, kind of structure, which is one of the most theoretical challenging uh, islands. So islands are very particularly, very particular structures. I will um, define them to you in a little while. But what uh, is very interesting about them is that although most linguistic theories claim that sentences that violate these islands constraints are ungrammatical and uninterpretable, I will actually show you a bunch of experimental evidence showing that there are gradient patterns of acceptability for island violating sentences. And we can also actually interpret at least some of them to a certain extent. So uh, this really calls for a theory of gradients. And finally, to account for these facts, I will present a view that we still assume that the grammar is a rule-based system, but it will be a more flexible rule-based system, let's say. So in this view, sentential elements can be coerced under specific circumstances to play a role that does not fully fit them. And in this system, unlike 
more, more traditional systems of more traditional systems of grammars, structure formation is forced even under suboptimal circumstances, and so you can generate semi-grammatical structures in this system. Okay, so let me start with uh, ungrammaticality. Okay, so um, grammatical rules are phrase structure rules that take this general form. So here we have A rewrites as B and C. So this is a very general notation. And we usually um, represent graphically this notation in this way. So A is the mother node and B and C are the daughter nodes. So if we want to take a linguistic example, we can have a rule like this. So VP rewrites as a V and MP. So VP is a verbal phrase that we write as a verb and a noun phrase. And we can illustrate this in that way. Here I use a triangle as a shortcut for NP, but we can also spell out this rule in this way. So in P, the noun phrase rewrites as a determiner and a noun, and we have this other little um, tree. Okay, so let's see how we can apply this these rules to generate a very simple sentence. Like, let's consider John loves the book. So this is a toy grammar. Um, and this these rules, these three rules, actually allow us to generate this sentence. So S is the sentence and P and VP. So if you apply each of them, then you get your syntactic tree. And what does it happen when we have an ungrammatical sentence like John loves fell? So here, the problem is that you can generate the syntactic tree up to this point, but then when fail comes, there is no rule uh, in your grammar that actually allows you to uh, integrate this word into the, into the tree. And so this is why we say that the derivation here crashes. Okay, so now I want to show you uh, our slightly more complex case, uh, but first I need to introduce a bunch of terminology, uh, a bunch of terms and concepts that we will need uh, during this presentation. So the first one is the concept of long distance dependency. So long distance dependencies are dependencies between two elements in a sentence that are in a syntactic and semantic relation, but they are not adjacent in the sentence. Um, so for instance, this is the case of interrogative sentences, like what did you think that John read? So here, what? is the syntactic and semantic object of the verb read, but the two are far away in the sentence. Um, and here with the underscore, I indicate the original position of the verb what, of the WH word what. So this is the position in which we can interpret it because it's the object of read. And we call this underscore a gap. Okay, so there are a bunch of ways to encode long distance dependency in phrase structure rules. And one of these is through slash feature notation. So for instance, let's consider these, um, these three. So this is a simplified tree for linguists, like I'm dropping the do support for instance, is just to give you an idea of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. So here we have what, uh, which is the long distance WH element, which is an NP. So here through this slash feature notation, we are basically telling the system that there is this unattached element that needs to be uh, keeping memory up until the verb is reached because we can interpret this what only once we have the verb, the corresponding verb. And so we have this notation, the slash NP means exactly that. There is this um, pending element that we are um, uh, propagating down the tree. And then we can discharge it uh, as soon as we reach the verb. Okay, so now that we know all of this, let's see how we can generate a slightly more complex sentence, like, what did you think that John read? So here I wrote a toy grammar, uh, but let's imagine that this is exhaustive. Okay, so here are, this is all, these are all the rules that we need in order to generate this sentence and a bunch of other sentences that I will show you in a while. So let's just study to make sure that we are all on the same page, the first uh, rule. So here we have a CP, um, which is what we use when we also have an embedded clause in the sentence. Then we have this notation, this NP, 
and what into parentheses. This is basically the lexical element that corresponds to this noun phrase. Um, so here we know that this NP is what. And then again, we have the slash notation that I just explained to you. So if we use these sentences, then we can generate the, the tree. Uh, and so in this tree, I applied all these sentences or most of them. Okay, so again, this is a simplified tree. I'm again dropping the do support. Now let's consider another example, which is another grammatical sentence. What did you wonder about? So here we have a different verbs. We have a prepositional phrase, but again, these, no problem. We can easily generate this tree by applying uh, these rules of the grammar. But now let's consider what happens when we have an ungrammatical sentence again. Um, so this actually, sorry, this will probe our discussion on island because this is an island. So here we have, what did you wonder whether John read? This is ungrammatical. And so what happens is that up to wonder, the grammar that I wrote actually allows us to generate a tree exactly as we did before with the sentence, what did you wonder about? But then when weather comes, there is no rule in this grammar that allows you to uh, integrate this word uh, into the syntactic tree. So the only rule that we have for weather is rule number nine, and it requires a CP as a mother, but here we have a PP slash NP, so we cannot uh, integrate this word into the, into, the, into the tree. And therefore, the derivation of the sentence stops. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that we cannot generate ungrammatical sentences under the traditional view. And now let's turn to gradients. So here, as I told you, I will focus on a particular case, islands. So let me first introduce what islands are. So islands are encapsulated syntactic domains that prohibit the establishment of a long distance dependency inside of them. So here in these examples in red, I, uh, I put the island domain. For instance, let's consider weather islands. What did you wonder whether John read? So whether John read is an island, so we cannot have a gap inside of island, meaning that we cannot have a long distance dependency inside this kind of uh, domain. So in English, you, can, you can't ask a question uh, like this. Um, another kind of islands are complex NP islands, like what did you hear the news that John read? And a third kind of islands are adjunct islands. What did you smile because John read? So all these sentences are ungrammatical. These are not, uh, I mean, there are many more islands. Here we are just focusing on uh, three of them. Okay, so what is intriguing about islands is that despite they are ungrammatical, uh, it seems that there are patterns of gradients. Um, so for instance, if we uh, substitute what, a simple WH element, with a lexically specific one, like which book, some of these islands uh, improves, so they become more acceptable. Like which book did you wonder whether John read? This is um, judged as more acceptable than what did you wonder whether John read? Same thing for the complex NP islands. Which book did you hear the news that John read? This has been tested to be better than what did you hear the news that John read? Well, for adjunct islands, nothing changed. You can have a simple WH, you can have a lexically specific one. Both of them are, um, are bad. And I will show you now um, like a bunch of results supporting what I just said. So this is a um, data from Sprouse and Messick 2015. We have weather islands, complex NP and adjunct islands. Here we have the results with the simple WH element like what and here with the lexically specific one, which book. And like DD scores are nothing else than a measure of the um, island violation effect. So the strength of the violation. So um, the higher the bar is, the worse the sentence is. So here, as you can see, we have pretty high bars, but oh, I'm sorry. But when you go there, uh, then for weather and complex NP islands, when you have which book instead of what, 
then the uh, violation is much milder because the bar is, um, is smaller. But it's still viola there is still a violation because the bar is significantly different from zero. So uh, there is still a grammatical violation, but it's, the sentence is it's improving in, in acceptability. Okay, so the data that I just uh, show you provide evidence for gradient acceptability patterns in island violating sentences. And now I will also show you that we have evidence that island acceptability is the result of comprehender's ability to interpret an island violating sentence. And how can they do this? Well, probably by establishing a dependency inside of the island. So I will show you now very briefly uh, the study that we conducted. So we use a procedure that is known as the maze task. So now I want to show you how the task works first, and then I will show you how we implemented, how we use this task for, uh, for island testing. So in a maze task, participants see a bunch of screens uh, in which they always have two words on the screen, except for the very first one. And it is that they have to select which word is the best continuation of the sentence. So they will start with the and then a white box. So here they are obliged, of course, to select the, the only word on the screen, and they will press the left button to do this. Then they will see a second screen in which they have me and they, and they have to select which word between these two can continue the sentence grammatically. And so they have to select they because the they is fine in English, but the me is not. So they will press the right button. And then extreme was, they will select was, and sunny is mild, they will select sunny. And so they will generate the sentence, the day was sunny. So it is called a maze task because it's like being in a maze and you have to find your path in order to generate the sentence. Okay, so in our case, um, participants read the island preamble word by word up to a critical point. So they read, what did you wonder whether the candidate solved word by word? So in this case, there was only one word on the screen and the second box was white. So they, was just, they were just reading the sentence word by word. But then after solved, something happened and they had to decide between two words which one they prefer as a continuation of this sentence. And they, and they could um, decide between a preposition before or a determiner, the. So if they go for the preposition before, then this is compatible with forming a sentence like, what did you wonder whether the candidate saw before the interview in Paris? While if they select the determiner, then they will generate a sentence like, what did you wonder whether the candidate solved the problem before the interview? So if they select a preposition, this is compatible with establishing a dependency inside of the island because the only object of the verb solved can be what. But if they go for the determiner, then this is compatible with not establishing a dependency inside of the island because actually solved already has uh, an object, which is the problem, and therefore what remains without any verb that can assign in it any thematic role. So the sentence is not interpretable in this sense. Um, so just to make it very clear, both continuations are ungrammatical. So in the first case, if they go for before, they are violating the island constraints, but they can interpret the sentence because if they manage to interpret what as being the internal object of solved, they can interpret the sentence. But if they go for the second uh, option and they select the determiner, so in this case, there is an element, this is what we call vacuous quantifica quantification. So there is an element that is, cannot be interpreted in, in the sentence. Okay, so uh, we tested all these three island types with this methodology. Um, and these are the results. So here on the y-axis, we have the proportion of dependency formation inside of the island. So, how many times they prefer the preposition of the, the determiner. So how many times they're willing to form a dependency inside the island. 
Um, and here we have weather islands, complex NP islands, and adjunct islands. And in pink, we have islands with a simple WH word, like what? And in green, with a complex WH, um, lexically specific one, like which problem? And so, as you can see, in the case of weather islands, in about 70% of the cases, they went for the preposition. So they were establishing a dependency inside the island. Um, in the case of complex NP islands, we're about 40%. This is significantly less often, but still um, a significant proportion of time. And for the simple WH cases, again, this is a lower uh, proportion, but we are about 20, 25% of the cases. And this is significant, like uh, it's not only noise, these are not errors because we add like a control condition in which we know that participant couldn't establish, it was not grammatical at all, it was like yes, no question to establish a dependency inside of them. And this allow us to establish the floor uh, of a dependency formation when we don't expect to form any dependency. And so the noise percentage is about five, six percent. So if we have something around 20, this is definitely not noise or random errors. And in the case of adjunct islands, as you can see, virtually they never try to establish a dependency inside of them. They try a little bit in the case of adjunct islands with complex WH phrases, but it's just a tiny bit. In, in the other one, virtually there are no cases in which they try to do this. So these results uh, suggest that there is a strong correlation between gradient acceptability patterns and the formation of an island violating dependency because these islands that receive higher acceptability rates are also these islands in which for which participants are more willing to establish a dependency inside of them. So now the question that we are asking is what are the mechanisms that can generate these gradient patterns? Are they grammar internal? Are they grammar external? And I want to be very clear here. So the findings that I just reported do not allow us to tease apart these two, uh, any hypothesis, like these two hypotheses bet mm, between grammar internal and grammar external. Why is this so? Well, because one could say, okay, the syntactic derivation may well fail when, we, when there is a grammatical violation, but then some extra grammatical mechanism kick in to cobble the sentence together. And this is why people sometimes can interpret islands because there is something extra syntactic that actually uh, play the role here. And it's because it's in virtue of these other mechanisms that they are able then to establish eventually the dependency inside of the island, but it's not the syntax per se. And the second option that we can entertain is that the syntactic tree is actually generated but it's generated in a more flexible rule-based system that also allows the generation of semi-grammatical sentences. So even if my data uh, do not allow us to, uh, um, to be certain about which one of these two hypotheses is correct, today I will um, explore the consequences of the second one. Okay, so the mechanism that we'll, we will invoke to account for ungrammatical sentence processing is what we call coercion. So coercion interve intervenes when there is no way to generate a full form syntactic tree by following the rules of the grammar. So in these cases, what, what the system does is to force one or more sentential elements to play a role that does not fully fit them. And uh, I will give you some very precise example uh, in one second. So there are two kinds of coercion we are interested with in. So the first one is what we call interpretable coercion. And then we have uninterpretable coercion. So interpretable coercion um, occurs when the system forms a thematically coherent tree. So all the thematic roles in the sentence are assigned despite there is some feature mismatch on some nodes, but the sentence result interpretable. So this is the case of when what uh, is interpreted as the object of the verb, 
So here we can assign all thematic roles, like what is the theme of the verb, um, even if we are uh, forcing the tree to form under suboptimal circumstances. An interpretable coercion instead is when the system forms a tree, but not all elements get their thematic roles and the sentence is uninterpretable. And I will show you a bunch of examples of this. And the other assumption, the other claim that we are making here is that interpretable coercion is triggered by the existence of a fully grammatical sentence that is analog, it's syntactically and semantically similar to the ungrammatical one. So it's really the presence of this similar structure that allow the system or the human mind to discover the interpretable coercion path. In the absence of a such analogy, then interpretable, uninterpretable coercion occurs. Okay, so there is a lot here, but I will show you example of each of these things that I just presented. Okay, so let's look at a case of uninterpretable coercion, very simple one. Like if we have the sentence, John loves fell, then the idea is that we again have this toy grammar. We only have three rules of the grammar. We cannot, under our traditional assumption, stick the verb, the verb fell into the tree that we just generated, but we can force the system to do this. Like we can really write an algorithm that allows us to do this. And so the verb get attached to a, no a noun phrase. This is a very bad attachment because <laughs> there is no rule that allows this. And so there is a mismatch between the two nodes, but we can force the system to do this. The, uh, the sentence will be completely uninterpretable because loves have thematic roles that are not assigned and the same goes for fell, but we can still form the sentence in this very brutal way. But now let's consider cases of interpretable coercion. And I will come back to uh, the island case to show you, to illustrate how interpretable coercion uh, occurs. So let's start with weather islands. Um, so remember that I said that interpretable coercion occurs if there is a fully grammatical sentence that resembles in some relevant respect to the ungrammatical one. So let's consider the weather islands. Which problem do, did you wonder whether the student solved? So if we think about it, this sentence is pretty similar to a fully grammatical sentence that is, which problem did you think that the student solved? So why are we claiming that the two sentences are pretty similar? Well, wonder and think are mental process verbs that subcategorize for a propositional complement. Then both wonder and think are followed by a complementizer, either whether or that. And both wonder and think can refer to the subject's degree of certainty about the embedded proposition. So wonder is a verb that indicates a high degree of uncertainty about the truth, falsehood of the complement, while think is a more biased verb toward the truth of the complement. Um, so if I think that the student uh, solved the problem, I'm pretty certain about it. If I wonder, then I'm less certain about it. Uh, even though um, this bias of think can be also reduced if we focus think. So if I say something like, I think that the student solved the problem, but I can't swear to it. So we can also modulate um, this degree. Um, so the argument is that because of the presence of this analog structure, this one, the extraction out of a declarative, um, in which wonder and think and whether and that appear and their close semantics, then interpretable coercion occurs most of the time, not always. Um, and how can we um, visualize um, interpretable coercion in the case of um, weather islands? So it would be, it would look like something like this. So this is um, a syntactic tree that we can generate following the rules of the grammar, but then wonder and whether cannot really be integrated in the tree if we only use the rule of the grammar. So this is where flexibility should um, intervene. And what it does is that when 
the system realizes that wonder is pretty similar to think and whether it's pretty similar to that. So sometimes it is able to force wonder to behave more like think and whether to behave more like that. So this is a coercion because we are forcing elements that their actual role is not exactly this one to behave like this. Um, but we are able to do this only if the two elements are not too dissimilar, too far away from one another. So when coercion occurs, then we can uh, allow the uh, slash propagation to occur. So we can um, actually interpret this sentence because think and that are slash propagating elements. So if we manage to coerce wonder and weather into think and that, then the sentence becomes interpretable because the, the slash feature is propagated down the tree and which problem can be interpreted as the internal object of solved. So now you may remember that we had a difference between in weather islands, between weather islands with simple WH and complex WH. And then we may ask, okay, but so why do we get this difference? And in particular, why uh, weather islands with simple WH looks like less coercible than uh, weather islands with complex WH. And the answer is that interpretable coercion is favored by several factors, one of which is semantics. So when you have which problem, a bunch of things the student solves, then this really forms like a really strong semantic unit that really pushes the system to discover the path of coercion. But when you have a very light WH word, like what, then um, there is more space for the system to not discover this, this path because the interpretative pressure is not strong enough sometimes to lead the system uh, to this path. And in order to try to, I don't know, be your, convince you that this may be the case, I use like a metaphor, um, which is this one. So in order to explain, try to tell you the difference between complex and simple uh, WH. So a complex WH element is a very rich element like this one. If you get this piece of the puzzle, it's gonna be pretty easy for you, or in any case easier for you to know where you have to put it in the puzzle because there, it's pretty unique and there is like a piece of boat and a piece of sky. So you may understand that, oh yes, it may, um, maybe I should place it in here. Uh, but if you get like a piece like this, which is a piece of the sky, this is not very rich in terms of information uh, that it brings. So it's much harder to find its right position. And something very similar happens uh, for simple, simple and complex WH. Complex WH really have a lot of content. And so it's much easier for the system to discover the coercion path, um, while simple WH elements are much lighter in this sense. So uh, it's harder to see um, where they, uh, they should be placed. Okay, so now let's turn to complex NP islands. Um, so here again, we are arguing that for complex NP islands too, there is an analog, an analog structures that is fully grammatical and that can trigger um, interpretable coercion. So in this case, if you have a sentence like a complex NP islands, like which problem did you hear the news that the student solved? Then the analog grammatical structure may be which problem did you hear that the student solved? So here, hear the news and here denote the same hearing event. And they also appear in the same syntactic context. So we predict here inter interpretable coercion to occur. And again, um, even more so when the WH phrase is complex than, than when it is simple for the very same reason that we just discussed. And so here is what's happened when uh, coercion occurs for complex NP islands. So here the rumor is coerced into here. And then slash propagation, um, can occur and we can interpret which problem as being the object of solve and we get an interpretable sentence. 
Finally, what does it happen for adjunct islands? So adjunct islands are different. Adjunct islands, we're claiming they are not interpretable, they are not interpretably coercible. Uh, why is this so? One could say, well, wait, why in this case, the extraction from a declarative is not a good analogy? Um, so if you get something like, which problem did you smile because the student solved? This is the adjunct island. Why the system cannot coerce this sentence into which problem did you think that the student solved? Well, here, what happened is that smile is an anergative verb, while think is a sentence complement verb. So they are syntactically very different. And that introduces a complement, while because introduces an adjunct. So an element that is not obligatory in the sentence. And they also have a very different semantics. So uh, in this case, uh, we predict that, I mean, interpretable coercion uh, is almost impossible to occur. Um, and so this is what would happen if interpretable coercion was happening. So we should coerce smile into think and because into that, but I hope I convinced you that this coercion is very unlikely to occur because these elements are very dissimilar one from the other. So what will actually happen is that the system will drop the uh, slash propagation um, here. And so we will not be able to actually interpret what as being the internal object of salt. Okay, so, um, so the main claim uh, is that gradients can be generated through a rule-based system under the assumption that syntax is coercible. So the idea is that when no rule can accommodate the input, then the system can be made more flexible to um, integrate the words into the sentence. And flexibility is an option only when the ungrammatical sentence is similar enough in some relevant respects that we discussed to a fully grammatical sentence. So the system is able to coerce its sentential element to play a role that is not perfect for, for them but at the same time, that is not too far away from their actual role. And here I have an example, like a real life example to try to convince you and explain you what really interpret interpretable coercion is. So like, let's think about this case, like using a knife as a screwdriver. This is maybe something that um, we all tried at least once if we don't have a screwdriver. So this is final. I mean, the knife is not, is not a screwdriver, but we can use a knife as a screwdriver if we really need it. Like it's not too far away uh, from it and we, can, and we can get it done. And so interpretable coercion is something like this. We can force something that is not really done for, the, for having that particular role to play that role. It's not too far away. But what about like using a hammer as a screwdriver? Well, this is like the results would not be perfect. <laughs> so in this case, the operation would be much more brutal. Uh, so we can still do this, but it's much more similar to in an interpretable coercion. Here, a hammer is really not like a screwdriver. So the difference between the two is important. So uh, the result that we will get will far from being perfect. So all these claims rely on the idea that similarity analogy between structures is really key uh, in syntactic processing, language processing in general, um, because I said that comprehender's ability to parse an island fundamentally relies on the existence of a fully grammatical sentence that resemble the island structure. And one may wonder why similarity should be relevant at all in accounting for language processing phenomena. Uh, and it is, this is not a really mainstream idea, even if there are uh, like syntactic theories that uh, rely a lot on similarity, like relativized minimality. But this is not something that we really use in syntax very often. And so here, again, I will use another analogy. Let's see if this works for you. So I thought it would be useful to think about language 
as a process that brings some similarity with brain teasers. So when it is that when it comes to parse a particularly cumbersome sentence, then in order to understand this sentence, we, our mind must find its path through this sentence. And this is somehow similar to what we have to do when we have to solve a mental brain teaser like the ones that are here. There is a precise sequence of moves that we have to discover in order to get it right. So for instance, here, you take these two pieces and then you have to move one around the other. And then at some point you have like to twist it in that particular fashion. And if you do it right, then eventually you will be able to pull it over and you will have solved this. And the idea is that once that you, that the mind finds this sequence, then sometimes this very same sequence can be successfully applied to solve very similar other brain teasers. So the idea is that if you get it right once, then you can transpose this knowledge, this sequence of move that you, um, that you learn to solve similar uh, puzzles. Um, so let me like, give you some linguistic example. Um, in order to successfully parse very cumbersome sentences, even grammatical ones, um, so this may be like a challenge and I will give you some example. Like let's take center embeddings, like the rat, the, the cat, the, the dog, love, chase, died. So this is very difficult uh, to understand. But then if you really think about the structure of language, you may be able to find your path, your, success, your sequence of moves in order to solve this puzzle. And then you, you may realize that, oh yes, the dog and love go together, the cat and chase and the rat and die. So they're really embedded. And then you will figure out that the meaning is the rat who was chased by the cat who in its turn was loved by the dog died. Wow. Or another case are garden path sentences that actually fool the parser at the beginning. And then you have like to reanalyze uh, the initial interpretation of the sentence. So like for instance, when you, if you say, when the men hunt the birds that cheetahs eat typically scatter, you probably, uh, interpreted at first the birds as being uh, the object of hunt. But then when the rest of the sentence comes, uh, then you say, oh, well, no, I was wrong. And actually, if you just put like a comma here, you will realize that the sentence means when the men hunt, the birds that cheetahs eat typically scatter. Or let's consider an even worse case of garden path, like the horse race past the barn fell is really mind blowing. But actually, if we think about this, then what it means is that the horse that was raised past the barn fell. So in language, even fully grammatical sentences may be like brain teaser in order to understand them, we really have to find our path and reason about the structure of language to solve them. And my claim is that for instance, for islands, if you know how to solve a sentence like, what do you think that the student read? And by solve, I mean, understanding the what is the object of read. Then if you realize that there is a similarity, if your brain realizes that there is a similarity between this sentence and this other one, then you may be able also to understand this. And what I'm claiming is that it's possible that our mind is doing something like this when we are able to understand island violating sentences. And probably something very similar may also happen in other cases like center embeddings. If you know how to solve the rat that the cat chase died and you understand how a sentence like this works, then maybe you're able to transfer this knowledge to this one. If you think about it, you will be able to understand also this sentence. So this is the main intuition uh, that I wanted to um, uh, discuss about today. And I also want to say that we implemented all of these in a 
model that I will not present to you, don't worry, because I know it's, I don't know for how long I, I, I spoke, but for a while, I think. So I will not discuss these center-organized sentence processing models, but it, I really want to say that all of these then, in the end, must be, I mean, um, it would be better if we could implement all of this intuition in a uh, fully fledged mathematical model that actually implements for real um, all, all of these concepts. So we did it. Um, and all the idea of self-organization is that self-organization is a nice example to, is a, it's, a, it's a nice model um, to naturally implement the concept of coercion and flexibility because there is a lot of flexibility in self-organizing system. So the elements can really interact among them in all possible ways, and then they actually work in order to find the best uh, possible combination. And if there is no such a combination, because the sentence, for instance, is ungrammatical, then the system is still able to settle in a suboptimal um, um, state, but it will still form uh, a sentence. So all these properties of um, SOSP um, are just a natural case for, I mean, they, they offer a natural framework to implement all of the, all the ideas that I discussed about today. So there are also a bunch of papers that we may, you may want to check if you uh, are interested about this model. And we also gave a talk to AMLAP this year. Uh, so all of this is, is on the internet. This is probably the only good thing about the pandemic is that all of this is recorded somewhere. So <laughs> we can check it out. Um, so thank you. And I also want to thank the Marika Foundation, uh, the Marika de Vincenzi Foundation, uh, who supported this research. And then also the Yukon uh, IBEX and NBL and the University of Connecticut and my colleagues, of course, and you for being here today. Thank you.